Around the world, nine million criminals behind bars. Armed robbers, rapists and murderers. Most surrender to incarceration. Some fight back and escape. Tonight, a self-proclaimed innocent soldier attempts an escape from paradise. It's impossible, absolutely impossible. With all the cameras showing, not happen. In New Zealand, they use brains and brawn to break out of their supermax. I mean, they really were sort of, you know, criminal masterminds. And the Alcatraz escape, they didn't want you to know about. He finally made it, and he broke the escape-proof myth. This program contains reconstructions. The prison breaks are real. Monaco, on the Mediterranean. Billionaires and big yachts. Playground of the rich and famous. Ex-Greenberry, Ted Meyer, arrived in this rich man's world from the US in August 1999. Landing a dream job working for 67-year-old multi-billionaire, Edmund Safras. According to Forbes magazine, he was the 199th richest man in the world. Suffering from Parkinson's disease, the tycoon required round-the-clock care. Ma was both bodyguard and nurse at $600 a day. Four months later, in December 1999, the billionaire Edmund Safras and the female nurse perished in a blazing inferno in his penthouse. Everyone could see the smoke on the horizon. A building right in the centre in one of the most prominent parts of the principality was on fire. Ma claimed assailants had broken in. There was an assassination attempt on his life. And I stopped that assassination attempt and almost lost my life. Ted Ma was stabbed. Bleeding from a stomach wound, he lit a fire in a waste paper basket to trigger alarms. Within five minutes, there was around 86 of Monaco's finest police department showing up and 56 firemen. And then for the next slightly under three hours, everybody stood around and did absolutely nothing. By the time authorities got to the penthouse, Safras and the female nurse are dead from smoke inhalation. Ma's stomach wound would require 100 staples. His wife, Heidi, rushed to Monaco, but when she arrived, the finger was pointed at her husband. Ma signed a confession, saying he lit the fire in an attempt to perform a heroic rescue of his boss but the document was in French. Ma only speaks English. The whole circumstances, the alleged uh, intruders, the fact that he had injured himself, the fact that he had uh, allegedly set the fire, the whole case was, was, couldn't have been scripted. It was absolutely stuff of Hollywood. Ma's trial took three years. He claimed he'd been framed. The Monaco police coerced him to confess by threatening his wife's safety. And he asked why other bodyguards had been given the night off. All to no avail, Meyer was given 10 years for manslaughter. This whole trial was a complete sham. I was told that I was gonna be set free after the trial, that I was gonna be looking at the worst of involuntary manslaughter charge at the worst case scenario based on the inaccuracy and the, and the gross incompetence of the firemen and the police department. And I was given double that. In 2002, Ted Meyer was sent to Monaco's only prison. Built in the 17th century, it houses 200 criminals. A world away from the paradise below, Meyer was facing 10 years with no visitation rights, even from his wife and children. It was probably one of the best prisons in the world, physically wise, but on the flip side of that, it was probably the worst prison in the world, psychologically. You could never speak to anybody. With deep cell windows layered with mesh, Monaco prison was thought to be totally secure. And with the highest concentration of police per capita in the world, Monaco would seem an escape-proof country. But Ted Meyer, still claiming he was wrongfully incarcerated, is determined to break out and as a plan that will shock this jet-set capital.
Alcatraz Island, San Francisco Bay, 1962. The most famous prison in the world. It was an island fortress that was impossible to escape from. But that didn't stop them trying. The point was, they thought that it was escape proof because of this treacherous bay. Alcatraz captured the imagination of the American public and eventually the world uh, because it was an island and because it was allegedly escape proof. And it was the first supermax pen. Up until 1962, quite a few people had tried to escape from Alcatraz and none had been successful. Of the many attempts at escapes, there hadn't been one single survivor. John Paul Scott was determined to change that. A career criminal convicted of armed robbery, sentenced to 30 years. And Daryl Lee Parker, also convicted of armed robbery, sentenced to 50 years. Between them, Scott and Parker had 80 years of time to serve. They had two choices, rot in jail or risk certain death and try to escape. On Alcatraz, every prisoner has to work. Scott and Parker are assigned to kitchen duty. It was easy work and their supervision was lax. They were left alone, sometimes for 10 minutes at a time. And the window in the storeroom below the kitchen could not be seen by the guard's watchtower. Their problem was that it was secured by one and a half inch thick steel bars. Although they knew it would take years to cut through the bars, the pair calculated that this was their best chance of escape. But Alcatraz was due to close within a year and prisoners were already beginning to be relocated to other prisons. Desperate to escape, and knowing time was against them, Scott and Parker knew they had to come up with a much quicker way to get through those bars. Auckland, New Zealand, 1998. Nestled behind endless stretches of razor wire is the foreboding Paramorimore prison, nicknamed Parry by the guards and inmates. It's an unusual place, it's got its own culture, even for a police officer, there is uh, the hairs stand up on the back of your neck every time you walk into that place. Parry Prison is New Zealand's only maximum security facility, housing all its worst offenders, including four dangerous felons who were desperate to escape. 22-year-old convicted murderer, Graham William Burton, serving life. He was known as a very, very hard man uh, and someone that's... Um, really wasn't being mixed with, uh, messed with even in prison. 41-year-old Arthur Taylor, a career criminal with a genius IQ, racking up 130 convictions over three decades. Taylor had only spent five of his adult years out of prison. He's what you would describe as a high-profile New Zealand criminal. Uh, he does enjoy the limelight. Uh, he's an intelligent and, and extremely industrious uh, person. 21-year-old Darren Crowley, serving life for killing a young man at a New Year's Eve party. And 18-year-old Matthew Solomon Thompson, a vicious bank robber, serving 11 years for a violent armed robbery crime spree. We considered him and the others to be an extremely high risk. So we believe them to be very violent people who like to use firearms, who had the propensity to use them, uh, and were quite ruthless. Locked up together, the gang of four began searching for a way to bust out. In March 1998, they stumbled across a broken perspex window in the shower block. It led directly to the prison yard. The space was just big enough for an arm. They reached through to work out how the bars on the other side were attached and realised with the right tools, both windows and bars could be removed. They found a crack in Paramorimo's defences. Somehow they managed to get a, a hacksaw blade into prison, and it was basically a, a period of weeks where um, you know, they took turns at night, soaring through our shower block. 
After smuggling in some spanners, their escape kit is complete. Just smuggling some of those things into prison would have, would have been hard enough in itself. And I mean, they really were sort of, you know, criminal masterminds. Over a three-week period, the gang take turns to soar quietly through the perspex window. As they cut, they conceal the gap by filling it with soap. Finally, the window pane is cut through completely. June the 18th, the four are ready to make their move. They really only had one shot at if, if um, any of them had been caught. I mean, that would have been, a, you know, that would have you know, been a massive sort of clamp down on security even more at that prison. After dinner, prisoners have recreation time until the 7 p.m. head count. The gang make their move. They remove the perspex pane they've so carefully sewn through and start working on the nuts holding the bars in. But after an hour and a half, and with only five minutes to go before the 7 p.m. head count, the bars are still intact. The gang is forced to hurriedly replace the perspex and head back inside, leaving their handiwork in plain sight. But the window bars are not their only problem. I'd be very surprised if these four have gone to this much effort without first arranging some outside assistance. An associate is cutting through the perimeter fence from the outside. Now, with a getaway car parked out the front, a hole in the fence and the shower block bars still intact, this escape looks doomed. Even a cursory inspection by the guards will destroy four months of planning. Coming up, in Monaco, Ted Meyer makes his move. You could taste freedom at that point, so it was very exhilarating. And on Alcatraz, Scott and Parker are handed a gift. This was an escape attempt that was really planned by other people. Monaco Prison, December 2002. Greenberry Ted Meyer, convicted for the manslaughter of his billionaire boss, claims he's been framed and is planning an escape. But Ma is locked up alone. His escape requires an accomplice. He hooks up with Italian Luigi Chiardelli. A small-time criminal uh, with a long-time record. Luigi was on remand for armed robbery charges in Italy. He wasn't a very happy camper, as Americans would say, about his incarceration in Monte Carlo. There was no formal arrest warrant or nothing on him, so he was basically there waiting. Luigi is trustee of the prison library and has the prison director's ear. He convinces the director Maher is a suicide risk and suggests he be moved into the same cell. Why don't you put me in with Ted so I can keep an eye on him? And the prison director said, oh, that's a very good idea, Luigi. So that was phase one. Maher's plan is simple. They'll climb out of their cell window and down to the ground. But first, they need the tools to hack their way through the bars and mesh. Maher smuggles a letter to his sister in America. Distressed by his plight, she hides four small hacksaw blades in a Bible to be delivered by a priest who visits Maher regularly. This unwitting priest is the perfect mule to ferry the blades past prison security. The person that was bringing, bringing it in had recent cardiac surgery and could not be passing through a metal detector because of a pacemaker. So that worked out very well. Armed with the tools to potential freedom, Maher and Luigi's plan is set in motion. But there are six steel bars and two steel mesh grills to cut through. It was just a blade, and so it was very, very painstakingly slow. Maher begins to sew away at the 46 individual steel strands in the grill. You could only make small cuts because otherwise it would be like a violin making a squeaking sound, so you had to be very, very quiet. But the galvanized mesh is tougher than expected. It had barely cut through just that first level with two blades being as smooth as a baby's bottom on all the teeth completely ruined, and I didn't realize that I didn't know at that point if I was gonna make it. To conceal each night's work, they meticulously glue the wires back together and paint them with surplus smuggled from the library by Luigi. If 
you don't touch, but you point where the cut is, there's no way you could find it. And I made sure that it was 100% effective. There are three guards for each prisoner, and random cell checks happen at any time. So Ted had to hide his precious hacksaw blade each day. Knowing that the refrigerator is metal, and they're going there with the metal detectors and everything, I concealed them within the refrigerator. And they, they could turn this thing upside down and all around, and you would never find them. It was flawless. After three grueling weeks hacksawing, Meyer is finally through the grill. His next challenge is a four centimetre thick steel cross. Unlike the mesh, the steel bars are surprisingly soft, and Meyer realises by cutting through the top and only halfway through the bottom, he can bend them down. But at six foot three, it'll be a tight squeeze. My sternum to my back spine is exactly 22 and a half centimeters. So I could practice going through those steel bars in between the ladder on the bunk beds and knowing that you had to relax and not panic because you would get stuck. Maya speaks no French or Italian. Once he's out, he'll be easily spotted. So he plans to avoid public transport and run. For that, he needs to be fit. Routinely, I would go down to where they used to have this old bomb shelter downstairs, and then it was very, very small. And I would run in circles down there when I was allowed to. It's like like a rat running in a, in a trap, but you have to have in your mind to know that you're physically conditioning yourself with your heart and your legs. Two weeks after cutting through the mesh, Maya finally soars through the last layer of bars. First time I saw green in the promenade there, and the the garden, and you could actually see, you could taste freedom at that point, so it was very exhilarating. But there's a huge problem. The prison was originally built as a fort with sheer, unscalable walls. A massive 12 meter drop to freedom. That was another dilemma. I just, I'm not Superman, I can't fly, and anyone trying to fall or try to scale down that would have surely broken their legs. Plus, there's a swivel head security camera right above them. They set up a $10,000 camera on the outside that would be panoramic that swung back and forth. It seemed Ma and Luigi were facing overwhelming odds. It's impossible, absolutely impossible. With all the cameras showing, pff, not happen. Alcatraz, an escape-proof island fortress in the middle of San Francisco Bay. In 1962, it was packed with America's most desperate criminals. Soldiers guard the cell blocks where the most desperate federal prisoners are under lock and key. They were always trying to escape. They were always working at it, all the time. Although others have attempted to escape from Alcatraz to the mainland, no one has ever lived to tell the tale. John Paul Scott, inmate number 1403, and Daryl Parker, inmate 1413, plan to escape by cutting through the thick steel bars covering a window in the kitchen storeroom. They had several tools, one of, one of which was a, a grill scraper that with a serrated edge. But with only months left until they are due to be transferred out of Alcatraz, it seemed an impossible task. That was until a departing prisoner told Scott he wasn't the first to try and cut his way to freedom. This was an escape attempt that was really planned by other people. And when those people were transferred, uh, the plans sort of got transferred to Scott. Relays of prisoners had quietly been sewing away at the bars for years. They also used string impregnated with floor wax and something like Ajax, you know, cleansing uh, unit, which is surprisingly abrasive. And they sawed those bars over months uh, a little bit at a time, a little bit here and there. Guards regularly checked the bars and the cells and prison windows, but the storeroom had been overlooked. That was one place we didn't really check the bars like we did their cells, where you'd hit them with a rubber hammer, and if it's a kind of a blunt sound, then you knew that you know there's a problem. Scott knew that once through the bars, they would face three major challenges. The first was to make it to the water undetected. The second is now December, the coldest month of the year, and the water is freezing. The third, 
it was common knowledge at Alcatraz that the bay was swarming with man-eating sharks. Paramarimo Prison, Auckland, New Zealand. The country's only maximum security penitentiary. Where four tough inmates, convicted killer Graham Burton, career criminal Arthur Taylor, murderer Darren Crowley, and bank robber Matthew Thompson have become unlikely allies in their bid to escape. But they had to abandon their attempt to go back inside for a head count, leaving a getaway car, a hole in the perimeter fence, and a sewn window in clear view. With the head count over and time running out, the gang rushed back to the shower block, desperate to finish the job. The last nuts are unscrewed and the bars are finally removed. Dropping silently to the ground, the gang raced to the hole in the fence. They crawl through and run for the stashed getaway vehicle and disappear into the night. Prisoners, when, when they're in prison, think about escaping, they'll just say, Parry, you can't escape from Parry, but these guys clearly proved that you could. And just 10 minutes later, inside the prison at the 745 head count, their absence is discovered. It was a, a top priority for the New Zealand police to track them down before they hurt anybody. When the police dogs find discarded prison clothes, roadblocks are set up with a three mile radius around the prison. Police say the four men could be the most dangerous group ever to have escaped from our prisons. Police are assuming the men are armed. I think there was a fair bit of terror in the area, especially in Primary, with the fact that you know some of these guys who have escaped were very dangerous people. But the armed and dangerous escapees have slipped through the net, and police fear the worst. Monaco, playground of the rich and famous, January 2003. Ted Maher, maintaining his innocence of the manslaughter of a billionaire banker, has soared through his cell bars. But he and his Italian accomplice, Luigi Chiardelli, are now thwarted by a 12-metre drop and a security camera. I fabricated uh, a cord made out of plastic bags, and uh, this was a, a total of 46 bags that I folded and scotch taped together and weaved together to formulate a very, very strong rope. Their rope is ready, but what about the security camera? I clocked it and we did a 45 second pan from left to right and realizing that I had 22 and a half seconds to be out of the camera's way. On January the 22nd, 2003, Maya and Luigi are ready to go. Since guards routinely check cells every hour, they dummy up their beds. We had to make a couple good bodies because every hour the guards would come by. Maya and Luigi remove the mesh and bars from the window and tie their plastic rope to a bent bar. Waited for the camera to pan left and to the right, drew out the cord, and at that point, Luigi went first. With only 22 and a half seconds, Ted Maher is next. Neither is spotted, but then, to Maher's dismay, Luigi sprints away. As soon as his feet hit the ground, I guess, he, I guess he felt that he would be better off alone, and he took off. Without his interpreter and guide, Maher's planned escape route through Italy is now dead in the water. So here I am. I don't speak a word of Italian, which if I went to Italy, I would have been picked up immediately. Maher is now an escapee on the run in a country with more police per person than anywhere else on Earth. No matter how you approach Monaco, you have to go past a policeman, and if for any reason whatever, they will, they will stop you and ask to see your identity papers, which by law you have to have. Because of his high profile, Maher needs to disguise himself and fast. I took one of the sweaters that I had and cut the sleeve off, took dental floss and tied the distal end of it, inverted it and rolled it up, and it's a perfect hat. It looked like a designer, designer hat. <laughs> Put the hat on and took a pair of Luigi's glasses that he had for reading and which put those on. Maher bumps into a policeman and risks using one of the few French phrases he knows. Bonsoir, monsieur, comment ça va? And talk to them and they wave to me and I would continue to walk out. But the encounter leaves him rattled. 
So I realised I had to get out of there. He crosses the unguarded border into France and commences the 20 kilometre walk to the nearest city, Nice. It was very, very cold. In fact, I was sweating profusely because of, even though I was in great shape, it was, mind you, it was, it was freezing. And I actually developed a mild case of hypothermia. Four hours later, Maher finally arrives in Nice. He's desperate to get out of the cold, but it's three o'clock in the morning. Maher's a fugitive on the run in a foreign land with no money, no ID, and he can't speak French. Next, as police search New Zealand, the gang of four party on in a millionaire's mansion. They trashed it, really, using drugs. They'd obviously had a great time. And Scott and Parker leave Alcatraz the only way they can. Auckland, on the North Island of New Zealand. Four of the country's most dangerous felons, Graham Burton, Arthur Taylor, Darren Crowley, and Matthew Thompson, are on the run. An accomplice in their escape has provided tents and supplies, along with guns and ammo. But with the police hunt gathering pace, the gang know it's critical to put more distance between them and their pursuers. They head for a dense forest on the Coromandel Peninsula, 120 miles southeast of Auckland. The gang know that to survive the New Zealand winter, they need some mounting gear. So they smash their way into a fire station, stealing boots, wet weather gear, medical supplies and radios. It was just bloody lucky that nobody was there at the time that they broke in, otherwise uh, I fear that somebody would have um, bore the consequences of being there. They then make their way deep into the Coromandel. It's very rugged and uh, dense. Pretty crazy place. I mean, you, you probably go walking there and, and not be found if you didn't want to be found. If they wanted to hide, they could hide for a long time. There were old uh, abandoned gold mine caves. Police have no idea where to look for these dangerous felons. Well, they were sleeping rough. I uh, guess were out in that uh, dense jungle. They didn't have much food with them. So they were uh, living it rough, and it was at the middle of winter. On June the 20th, as temperatures drop again, the gang are forced to find a warmer hiding place. The foursome hike into the nearby beachside town of Tairua. In a stroke of luck, they stumble across a $3 million mansion whose owner, an American businessman, is on holiday in Hawaii. An acquaintance of one of the escapees, Joanne Hewitson, arrives to keep them company. Celebrating their newfound liberty, the foursome kick back and live it up. They trashed it, really. They'd obviously had a great time. Uh, been smoking uh, drugs, using drugs, um, lots of takeaways. But to stay on the run, they need more supplies. The next day, risking all, Taylor drives into town with Joanne. But within minutes, he's recognised by a police officer and flees back towards the mansion. The officer immediately calls for backup. The armed defenders squad surround the mansion, but their progress is thwarted by an ominous sight. The house itself has been booby-trapped. Police called me in because on arrival at scene there'd been uh, tripwires obvious going to packages um, and of course these hadn't been identified. With tripwires, booby traps and an armed gang, authorities now face a deadly siege. Alcatraz Prison in San Francisco Bay. Midwinter of 1962. John Paul Scott and Darrell Lee Parker, two armed robbers doing a combined sentence of 80 years. Together, they've cut through the bars of the kitchen storeroom. At 5.30 p.m. on the 16th of December, after a routine prison headcount, Scott and Parker make their move. They squeeze through the small hole in the bars and drop to the ground. Out of sight of the guard tower, they shimmy up a drain pipe onto the roof of the main cell block. Then, they sprint across the roof 
to the southwestern corner of the building. So far, Scott and Parker have avoided detection. Lowering a 15 meter electrical cord over the cliffs below, they slide down the cable into the darkness. As Scott and Parker scramble down the treacherous cliffs to the water's edge, Parker injures his ankle. And now they are facing a long swim in freezing conditions. A swim that no one had ever survived. They begin to blow up rubber gloves and then stuff the inflated gloves into the sleeves of their prison shirts. They tie more around their waists to keep them afloat. The escape so far has taken only seven minutes. Moments later, Scott and Parker plunge into the icy water and begin their perilous one and a half mile swim across the bay. Just 10 minutes later at 5.47, the alarm is raised. After a random head count, guards discover the pair are missing. A massive manhunt immediately swings into action. Aside from struggling to swim in the freezing, shark-infested water, they also now had to contend with the raging currents sweeping out into the Pacific Ocean. Monaco 23rd of January 2003. Ted Meyer has just busted out of Monaco prison and crossed the French border to Nice. At three in the morning, suffering from hypothermia and with no cash or ID, he knocks on the door of a budget hotel. The story was, excuse me, sir, I, I, my car is broken down on the auto route. You know, I, I've, I've, I look at me, I'm exhausted. It's in the middle of the morning. I've gone to try to reach my, for my wallet. I've lost my wallet. Can you allow me to make a collect call to my family so that I can get, get a room here for the night until I can, you know, get some identification? The manager buys his story. Okay, just help yourself. Maya phones his wife, Heidi, who tirelessly supported him throughout the trial. But the call doesn't go well. She and I can't help you. I don't have any credit cards, nothing. Slammed the phone down. Like, I can't believe this. Heidi has finally lost faith in her husband. She was convinced that I was guilty. Maya next calls his priest. My family gave him money, you know, to put on my account when he visited me for communion in the, in the, in the, uh, the prison every couple weeks. He said, Father Ball, I'm free right now. I need to recover the money that my family has given you so I can make safe passage to U.S. territory. Can you help me? Ted, no problem. I'll get it out of the bank. Call me tomorrow morning at 10.30. Having put his trust in a man of the cloth, Maya finally relaxes. I'm in the hotel. I'm exhausted. I'm shaking because of hypothermia. I get in this tub and take a nice hot bath and just sit back and just really, I've done it. It's, everything's going to be all right. He soaks up his newfound freedom, having no idea he's placed his faith in the wrong man. And during the morning, I made the phone call to speak to Father Ball in Monte Carlo. And I said, Father Ball, this is Ted. He goes, the man you want is on the phone. I mean, I, I'm in shock. I can't believe he's passing the, the phone over to the police. I hung up. Police have been questioning Maya's known contacts. And by sheer coincidence, they're standing right beside Father Ball when he receives the call. The Monaco police then traced the phone call. Uh, found out it came from a small hotel in these. They immediately contact the local authorities. I didn't have enough time to get on my, sh my jockeys and, and put up my pants and run downstairs and I opened up the door and there was five French nationals waiting for me. Ma gives himself up without a struggle. These guys get guns. I'm, you know, I can pretty much carry myself. Uh, you know, sure, I could take these guys out, but now I'm assaulting French nationals. I mean, I'm done. It's finished. I mean, there's no point. They have guns. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to get killed over this. Turned in by those he trusted most, Maya's meticulously planned escape is finished. I didn't expect to be betrayed by a woman that I loved, the attorney that was representing me as an American citizen, and a priest. It doesn't get any worse than that. Ma's Italian accomplice, Luigi Cardelli, survived on the run for two months before being caught. He was picked up on a vagrancy charge right next to the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Ma 
was returned to Monaco to serve out the remainder of his 10-year sentence, along with another nine months for escape. Only three people really know what happened inside that penthouse apartment. One of them is Ted Marr, one of them is Edmund Safra, and one of them is the nurse that died. After spending eight years behind bars, Marr was released from Monaco prison in October 2007. Now back in the USA, working as a nurse, Ted Marr is contemplating bringing action against those responsible for his incarceration. Tairua, New Zealand, 1998. Four dangerous criminals, two of them murderers, have been partying up in a vacant beachside mansion. As the armed defenders squad surround the building, they're confronted by tripwires and a bomb. After closer examination, the booby trap is found to be a fake. We were able to uh, make the area safe and then enter the house our armed defenders squad. Once police got into the house, they found it empty, but discovered guns were missing from the owner's collection. The escapees have bought themselves valuable time and used it to disappear out of the back door into nearby bush. But now police know they can't be far away. More reinforcements are called in from Auckland. A chopper with heat-seeking technology scours nearby forest. It was crazy. It was, yeah, it was like apocalypse an hour in the Coromandel. That night, the chopper pinpoints the four escapees and their house guest huddled together in the bush. The next morning, ground forces move in. Outsmarted by technology and surrounded by armed police, Taylor, the crook with a mental level IQ, gives himself up. Handcuffed and in custody, Arthur Taylor's week on the run is over. He was plucked from the bush by armed police just after breakfast, wearing only a flimsy jersey as protection against the cold. Like sort of magic, he walked out of the bush, um, wearing clothes that he had stolen from uh, one of the one of the houses that they'd broken into, um, unshaven, and uh, yeah, just wanted to give himself up. He had enough. Joanne Hewitson is also taken into custody, but the other three are still on the loose and Taylor has a message for them. Oh, sorry, Matty, Darren. Just, no, we're we'll good. So they haven't shot me, as the information we received, they were going to do it, um, so I don't do anything stupid for us. A career criminal with a fondness for the limelight, Taylor also calls in to a current affairs show. Well, what are they planning now? Oh, they'll hold out to the last. We knew that if it come to a, you know, a shootout, that they'd definitely get us. Police continue their manhunt, preparing for a shootout. We can't discount the fact that the outstanding people may well be uh, better equipped or better clothed than what Taylor was. I'm hoping they're buggered, I'm hoping they're tired and they just think that they've had enough and let's, let's give the game away, but we can't discount the possibility that they feel they're in there for the long run. A week after the escape, following a tip-off, authorities surround another holiday house north of Tairua. They believe the armed and dangerous Burton, Crowley and Thompson are inside. At 9pm, the armed defenders squad storms the house. I'm very pleased to report to you is that the three escaped prisoners from Perimeter Prison have all been apprehended. The jailbreak came to an end at this batch north of Tairua with a deadly survival kit. In that pack is a loaded um, shotgun. It's been sawn off. There's also a number of knives, there's maps, there's food items. Two more rifles were found under the house, which is owned by a German couple who use it as a holiday home. The house had to say they were surprised was an understatement. The method used to enter that address was such that uh, there was no possibility of them resisting. Caught off guard, New Zealand's most wanted surrender without a single shot being fired. It was very satisfying to have them back behind bars because of the threat that they posed to the New Zealand public. We did not want them being in a position where they would harm anyone or take a hostage to continue with their freedom. I love my mum and my family, Tom. I didn't mean to cause them all this trouble. The recapture of the fearsome foursome cost New Zealand taxpayers three quarters of a million dollars. Burton, Thompson and Crowley faced seven charges in relation to the escape. Taylor faced six. 
They each received another three years prison time. Next, have Scott and Parker missed time their deadly swim to freedom? 75% of every day, you cannot swim from the island to the city because the tides are really going to take you in another direction and in far more treacherous direction. Alcatraz, San Francisco, 1962. Daryl Parker and John Scott have escaped into the shark-infested freezing water of San Francisco Bay. But they have a bigger problem. The problem is, is that the island is situated in the bay, which is affected by tides which come across Alcatraz. You can actually swim from Alcatraz to San Francisco, but you have to do it at the very particular time. 75% of every day, you cannot swim from the island to the city because the tides are really going to take you in another direction and in far more treacherous direction. They're sweeping out into the Pacific Ocean where you do have great white sharks or they're sweeping over to San Jose, which is, you know, would take hours to get there and by then you'd probably succumb. Parker is falling behind because on the climb down the cliff, he broke his ankle. The two are becoming separated in the icy waters. Scott can't help Parker and pushes on alone for the mainland. But for Parker, the dream of freedom turns into a nightmare. Parker gives up and clambers onto a small cluster of rocks just 300 feet from Alcatraz. The guards spot him from the towers and start shooting at him. They were firing at him out there to hit the little Alcatraz to make sure he stayed there. And these are all tracers, so you know exactly what you're doing. And then when I was ordered around to pick him up, he was hurting. He was cold, his ankle was broke, and so that was no problem. Then we just, we had no security, we just wrapped him in a big rope, and I had people on the boat on top of the pastures. And I got him and took him back around to the dock. Within minutes, Parker is back on Alcatraz and in solitary confinement in the prison's notorious cell block D. Back out in the freezing waters of the bay, Scott has disappeared into the darkness. And then I start patrolling. The tide was going out at the time, so we'd go from San Francisco over to the north shores, back and forth, back and forth. And I was looking for Scott. The US Coast Guard is called in patrol boats crisscrossed the bay. Despite the giant manhunt, it seemed that Scott had either slipped through the net or drowned. There was a sense of frustration, yes. And the water was very rough. We were up and down and around and trying to find somebody in that water, and I knew it was going to be difficult. And it was. And we did not spot him. Exhausted and freezing, John Scott had reached the rocks underneath the south side of the Golden Gate Bridge. Scott worked for two hours swimming and floating towards San Francisco, but he finally made it and he broke the escape-proof myth. But the freezing cold water had dropped his body temperature a massive 4.5 degrees, and Scott was now desperately fighting hypothermia and perilously close to death. He couldn't move and needed medical attention, fast. He lay slowly dying on the rocks for almost an hour. He was discovered by a passing soldier, taken to a military base, and then handed over to the Alcatraz authorities. Scott even looked up at me when they were bringing him back at about one o'clock in the morning, and I look, looked down at him, he was on a stretcher. And he said, Mahoney, why didn't you pick me up? And I said, well, I was looking for you. The lifelong belief that escape from Alcatraz was a physical impossibility was shattered by John Paul Scott's five hours off the rock. It was our doom. When Parker and Scott left, that was uh, what killed us. Shortly after the Scott Parker escape attempt, Alcatraz closed down, and with it died the escape-proof myth. Next time, 
the peaceful countryside of Ireland is shattered by an armed breakout. This was an audacious, um, violent, vicious attack. In Australia, one of the most infamous prison breaks ever staged. Why not? You know, what did you have to lose? 12 years was a long time for a, you know, 23, 23-year-old bloke. And in America, a bizarre escape plan hangs from a rope made of dental floss. As if he moves, blow his brains out. <laughs> 